presentation here. Um, I'm going to stand over here because I'm going to again point at this one. I don't know if I can actually see what I'm doing so I'm up here. So, um, today, what I want to talk to you about is reverse engineering. So, someone uh, Jim Perth asked me to present the, the title was engineering cellular zones because I want to. I hope I can get across today. We're, we're far from understanding how these systems work, so we're really at the stage of reverse engineering and trying to understand how the, these are put together in nature first. So, of course, what our interest is um, is to, oh, I should also mention that this is a collaboration with a number of professors in, in Berkeley, Mike Marletta, Hawking, Dan Fletcher, and Evan Williams as part of the Energy Biosciences Institute. Of course, what we're interested in is, is there uh, economical means of taking uh, plant biomass and converting it into a liquid fuel, and this right now is a multi-stage process. And one possible way to improve this process is to use enzymes to hydrolyze uh, just a pre-treated bi plant biomass to break it down into simple sugars that can be fermented into so liquid fuel. And so we were we'd be very interested in understanding the enzymes, the cellulases, and cellulose of the nature that do this. And uh, first, a little bit more about the biomass. It's very complicated. It has a number of polymers, uh, hemicellulose, lignin, and cellulose, that are um, together in a, in a network that's, that's very hard for organisms to break down. And so it's a very complicated substrate. And that's probably one of the first two take home messages I want, I want you to take. And so, in order to understand enzymes that break this down, we also always have to keep our eye on the complexity of the biomass. So, in, in nature, there are uh, cellulose sy enzyme systems that can like, break down plant biomass are very complicated. Uh, the free enzyme systems are characteristic of very little bit of fungi is one type of system. The gold standard is Trichoderma ricei system. And there are strains of this fungus that can put out 40 grams per liter of these enzymes. And this is, again, an industrial standard. There are other systems that are used, for example, by anaerobic bacteria called cytosomes. And what these are, are an example is Clostridium pyrosolum. And we're studying Clostridium pyrosolum C7, and I'll get back to that in a minute. And there's, these organisms don't put out quite as much protein. And the way they do this is they, they have a large scaffolding protein that organizes multiple catalytic units that binds with the dog on them. So these enzymes, just a little bit more on the cellulase system, there are endoglucanases that can cut in the middle of the linear polymers, uh, you know, glucose polymers. There are um, exoglucanases that, that uh, chew in from either reducing or non-reducing ends of this, of this chain. And then the beta-glucosidase that hydrolyzes the products of these enzymes, which is the cell bias, the two glucose monomers. So this is uh, sort of a minimal set of enzymes that's needed to break down cellulose, uh, crystalline cellulose. So the cellulosomes can take might be a useful way of organizing those enzymes because of their potential uh, efficiency. By mass, it's thought that cellulosomes might be uh, the most efficient decolorizing uh, crystalline cellulose and not microcrystalline cellulose. There are a couple of studies that suggest this, although it hasn't really been proven in fact, but it's something that we're very interested in trying to understand. Uh, the cytosome, the central scaffolding protein, is very modular, and so the, it has uh, protein interaction domains called cohesion and doctrine domains um, on the enzyme that can be mixed and matched. So one idea that the Bayer's put out there is that we might be able to make design your cytosomes uh, once we understand how these are put together, for example, to break down plant biomass. So the, the, the long-term goal is to uh, uh, simple the most efficient cellulases and other types of hydrolases into cellulosomes. And the, the ideal would be to express these in the context of consolidated bioprocessing, processing where a single organism would be able to take plant biomass and convert it into a fuel. So cellulosomes are uh, multi enzyme complexes that are built around a scaffold, this, this uh, gray one in the middle here. And these are on the order of 100 to 200 kilodalton non catalytic proteins. They often have, um, so they have these cohesion domains that uh, look like W's here. And they also have a carbohydrate binding module typically. And in some organisms, they are self, they're associated to the surface of the bacteria. 
It's called Thiessen domain. It's a little over 100 amino acid domain that binds strongly to Docker domains. And the Docker domains are modules of, uh, that are on the enzymes. And so these are 50 to 60 amino acids. And they allow the, the enzymes to dock onto the scaffolding. Uh, and which is a carbohydrate module. So the catalytics of units, as you'll see in a minute, are, are there are many different types. There are also a number that are um, we don't understand what they are at this point. So put it in a little bit different perspective. What we want to be able to do is to understand native cellular zones, which are in some ways like a bacterial Swiss Army knife and CCPC7 on there. And once we understand these, we'd like to be able to make designer cellular zones. And some of them might be, um, this is actually um, the graduate students in our group, Chris Phillips, will be thinking about this. And they, once we understand this, we might be able to put these together um, in a recombinant way to, to make, uh, make use of them. So the key experimental challenges, and again, this is, um, there are a couple things here that are really the take-home message, is we want to be able to take, compare enzymes with between groups, not just within our group. So getting standardized enzyme assays is actually a big problem in the whole field. And what substrates do we, do we use for this? There are practical or simple substrates, and I'll show you an example in a minute, and for the past able to use the practical substrate. But the most informative are going to be ones related to real feedstock, plant feedstock. And so, so that's, a, that's a very tough question to deal with. So that also relates to fruit, fruit footage. So we also are developing a suite of imaging technologies to monitor enzyme dynamics on the substrates and um, monitor the substrates themselves. Um, we're worried about the So if we were to put this in a more graphical form here, the way my collaborators and I put this project together is to have a, a suite of interrelated experiments where we were looking at uh, microbiology, the genomics, the molecular biology of, for example, clostridious species, um, enzyme assay development, uh, how to standardize these bulk assays, uh, protein biochemistry, how do we purify these, these complicated mixtures of enzymes, and using that spec, and as you'll see, this is all you know, not having good genomic information. And then also using um, some higher end biophysical methods like single molecule spectroscopy to look at dynamics and also uh, on course spectroscopy to look at stuff very properly. So this is the, um, the kinds of things we're trying to do. And I want to focus in on just a couple of these areas, especially how they relate to the genomic information that we need. So, on the microbiology front, we've been interested in constricting caprol, caprosol and C7. So Susan Machine discovered this many years ago, with some references down here. And as a biochemist, I thought this looked like a really interesting organism to study uh, in terms of understanding cellular zone function. The cellular zones are actually relatively small at 500 to 600 kilodaltons. So that's small for a cellular zone. They often reach many megadaltons in size. That just makes life miserable for a biochemist. So they're secreted. So these cellular zones are not attached to the bacterial cell surface. And so they're secreted into the extracellular region. So they're soluble. And also is nice for a biochemist. Um, the homogeneity. There are some work done in Susan Machine's lab that suggested that at least some of these cellular zones could be purified to homogeneity. And they just could be separated into the state population. So where we are right now is we, one of the things these are very complicated systems, which we'll see in a minute. And if we want to sort of dissect these Swiss Army knives, we need to have understand the regulation regulation of how these uh, cellular zones are expressed, exported, and assembled under different growth conditions. And so our first uh, thing that we needed to do was to sequence the genome and analyze that so that we could begin to understand the, the regulatory network in the, in the bacteria. So we have the, the sequence, we had the sequence performed by four or five four life sciences, and we verified the sequence of the uh, 16 S ribosomal DNA directly from the genomic DNA prior to um, sequencing because we don't have a really good selection from this wild isolate and how to keep the culture pure. And so we wanted to verify that we're actually going to get the sequence of the organism we wanted. So that's why we did the 16 S sequencing first. So Caprosol in C7 is similar to other clostridial strains that uh, can degrade cellulose. Um, Clostridium thermosolum is a thermophile. It's a model organism in this, in this field, although this has cellulose zones that are, are really huge. They get all the size. 
clostridium solulicum is similar to the caprosolvents in the file. Another one I'm putting up here, you might hear about this later in the meetings, uh, stream of phytofermentin. It's, uh, it's a mesophile. It's not cellulitic, but it is, uh, or it's not cellulosomal, but it is cellulitic. And these all have a very low GC content, which has some of the, 30, the mid 30s, which uh, makes life interesting for cloning and things like that. So, in terms of the analysis, the, as I mentioned before, the cytosomes are on the smaller side, and that's based. Uh, we can see that already from the genomic sequence in the, in the size of the scaffold protein. So it has only six of these protein binding modules, these cohesin domains. Where, um, whereas some of these other model organisms, thermosome and cellulitic, have more cohesin domains. So the complexity of the cytosomes from these other organisms is, is much higher. The, the number of in, uh, potential cytosomal enzymes and other proteins in the genome about in the, in the range of 60 to 70 for these organisms. So, so again, the combinatorical uh, combinatorics of this are quite huge. You could have over 70 different proteins binding to six different binding sites on these scaffolding um, to make a cytosome. So there could be quite a few different types of cytosomes that are produced. So right now, we, uh, in terms of analyzing the genome, we've been working with Adam Martin's group of microbes online to, to gene call, gene trees, and things like that. And so this is the status. And so having this as our um, sort of toolkit, we could then move on and start thinking about protein biochemistry. And so I want to talk a little bit about how we're proceeding to see if we can isolate homogeneous cytosomes to study. And um, so again, protein biochemistry. So our goal is to be able to purify homogeneous samples, because otherwise we're not going to be able to do this in all other methods. And so the cytosomes are the, the supernatant of any culture that we grow. Um, so that's good because they're soluble, but that's a lot of volume to handle, and they're at low concentration. So we need to separate these large complexes from one another from, from these low concentrated samples. Um, complexes might differ by a single subunit. So again, we have seven potential proteins in a complex. Six might be uh, the same between two complexes, and then only one difference. So that, that could change, that could make the whole properties very similar. So one of the tools that we use for this is we use something called affinity digestion. And so, so the cellulose they have these carbohydrate binding modules. They can, if you have a complicated mixture in the supernatant, you can throw in something uh, called uh, phosphoric acid swollen cellulose, and it's like a sponge for these carbohydrate binding modules. And proteins that have those refine. This is easy to pellet. And then just by warming up the sample in a, in a buffer that's where the enzymes are active, the has to be dissolved, uh, chewed away by the enzymes, and then we have a concentrated uh, sample of protein. So this is, we can take liters of culture and concentrate it down to a few mils uh, by doing this. So then with that uh, concentrated sample, we can do things like uh, standard chromatography to try to separate these complexes. So what I'm showing here is an ion exchange uh, column elution profile where we've been able to separate different populations of cytosomes from a culture grown on a simple uh, cellulose polymer called Avacel. And this is just an SDS gel of these different fractions, one through five. And you can see that the protein banding pattern has changed. And so that's, that's quite nice. There are a couple of them that are somewhat of a surprise. We didn't expect to find the scaffold all by itself, like this. This is this uh, band up here. And then there are a couple of others that look fairly pure that we might be able to study. So without genomic sequence, so we couldn't get much further than this. And so uh, we, when we had the genome, we were able to do a little bit more sophisticated analysis, like this mass spec analysis. So the bottom-up mass spec analysis from these samples, um, cryptic digest. And so what we can do is for each of these fractions, we can identify all of the proteins that are um, purified using this affinity digestion protocol. And so um, from this more standard experiment, very quickly, we get to a much more sophisticated analysis what's there. And one thing that's quite obvious is that samples that look highly pure from an overloaded SDS gel, this S2, you start to see trace amounts of other proteins. This one in red is in all the different samples. And this, this is the that core scaffold and, uh, domain. And so you start to pick up trace uh, amounts of other proteins. And those can have uh, interesting effects on the activity of these samples. So we, and we saw that, actually. So this is a uh, digest of the of of Avicel 
and this is the unpurified uh, affinity digest uh, sample, so it's not fractionated, it's only, it's only affinity digest. And this is just the low soluble sugar released by that. And then for the fractions, one can see there are different levels of activity depending on the sample. So, so about genomics that, we, that launched the, and some of the molecular biology 
that we can do from that. Uh, protein biochemistry and the mass spec has been critical in terms of understanding these complicated mixtures that these organisms put out into the media. And we're using this kind of information to form our enzyme assays, develop those, uh, and also single molecule and atomic force across the types of experiments. And again, this has uh, all been due to the fact that we really had to have this, this, this genome for the organism in order to even get started in this project. So I want to thank the members of the group who have been doing this work. This was all started by three very courageous students who joined an already biochemist lab to work on biofuels. Uh, Veronica, Padma, and Will, and uh, since been joined by others in the group. Again, this is a collaboration with Mike Morelita and Williams, and Ha Yang and Dan Fletcher, and um, part of the Energy Biochemistry Institute. So at this point, I'll take questions. Questions? <laughs> Thank you. 